I'm in Portland, Michigan, on my way to meet with Chris Schoenberg. He's an expert at traditional joinery techniques and builds beautiful one-of-a-kind pieces. We need to pick up some lumber, so we're going to head over to a local supplier to get what we need. Chris, tell me where we're headed. We're going to be heading to L.L. Johnson Lumber, and it's been around for, I think, about 100 years. Really, really nice, cool lumber yard. We're going to um, see if we can find some nice white oak, hopefully some quarter sawn white oak. I really like working with that. We'll just look around and see what they have in stock, because stuff constantly comes in and goes out, so you never really know what's going to be there. Chris, this is the bookshelf we're going to be building, right? Yes, this is a design I came up with that is heavily inspired by Japanese woodworking. There's no nails or screws in it. It's just a really cool piece. Yeah, it's absolutely beautiful. And this is all hand tools, right? We're just going to be using hand tools today. Yeah, for the most part, we might dimension some wood using power tools just to get through the kind of boring, mundane stuff. Right. Uh, but for all the joinery, we're going to be using pretty much all hand tools. Man, I'm, I've been really excited to work with you because my, my hand tool skills could use some help. You know yeah, what I mean? We, so. all, we can always use help. With that, so. <laughs> and tell me, what species did you use for this? So for the sides and the shelves, we're using white oak. This piece is Jara, I believe, okay. which is really similar to the species we're going to use today, which is Jatoba, which is another exotic, really bone hard wood. It's very difficult to work with hand tools, but it's really beautiful when you do accomplish it. Sure, sure. And you've already prepped some of the materials for us that we picked up. Yeah, I took some of the uh, white oak that we picked up and I glued it together for our shelves because our boards were not wide enough. And I also sandwiched a couple pieces together for what's going to be our feet. Awesome. Man, I am excited. So you ready to get going? I'm ready. It's going to be fun. All right, let's do it. All right. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is basically get a flat face and a flat edge on some of this rough wood. But we're going to use the planes to get the glue off and make sure the tops and the faces are all really nice and smooth. The longer the plane is, the better it's able to skip over low spots and hit high spots to create that nice flat surface. I'll do a couple in the middle there. Okay. Dude, that is dead on. Isn't that nice? It's always really rewarding when you don't see light through your square. It's like, yeah. oh yeah. And that's a hard thing, man. You know, I've tried to do this <laughs> at home before. It, it, it is hard. It's hard to get in stock square. It, yeah. But it's so important, because we're asking for people to look at our joinery. We're having all this exposed through mortise and tenons and stuff. So we want it to be really nice and square, really nice and crisp. Those sharp tools, really detailed layout, make a big difference. Okay pretty good. All right, so the last piece we have left is the top. Got a little more to do. You want to come over and give her a shot? Oh, yes, please. Yeah. There you go. A little bit like chewing gum and walking <laughs> at the same time. Right? Oh yeah. Dude, this is holy smokes. Beautiful. That's tight. Look at that. Very good. So do we flip it and do the other side now? No, we're actually going to use this reference face that we created on the fence of the table saw, sawing all that out. It's a lot of work. All right. So we want to get to the fun stuff. So we're yeah. going to let the table saw do that work for us. All right, to the table saw. All right.
Chris, it looks like we got a page from the plans that you sell for this project. Yeah, after I built this the first time, I went ahead and reverse engineered and made some plans and it's a lot easier working off of these. Way easier, yeah, right? Yeah. So next we're gonna do layout. Yep. Okay. So uh, we're gonna just basically work off of the sheet for the side detail here, the side pieces, and just pick the beautiful side that we want out. Is there anything in particular you look for when, when you're looking like the show side of the wood, I'll call it. Yeah, so we picked out this quarter sawn white oak. It has these beautiful medullator rays on them. That's these discoloration points? Yep. Okay. And that's just this cool thing that white oak does. Some species do that. So just looking at these boards real quick, I have these two sides that look the best to me. And this is gonna be the left side as I'm looking at it here. So oh, gonna, right, right, right. Yeah, so I'm gonna stand these up. They're gonna be to the outside. And I'm just gonna label these so that we uh, can keep track of everything. So the next thing we do is we start laying out joinery. And you got a ton of different, you got some measuring scales here, you got some vernier calipers, some scribes, and can you show me a little bit, tell me a little bit about what you like to use and why? Yeah, so having accurate layout is extremely important and having accurate tools to do that layout is extremely important. My favorite way of doing layout is to use knife walls and knife marks with actual knives rather than a pencil and a square. So I use squares. I like combination squares. And these are called marking gauges. Mm -hmm. This is a Japanese style one, and this is an American style one. And you can set these and scribe lines, and that's what you're, you'll be cutting to. Mm -hmm. The cool thing about a knife line is that your chisel can drop into that for a super accurate cut. Oh, nice, very cool. Okay. Does that makes sense? Yeah. All right. Let's get to work. Cool. We have a tenon at the bottom here, and I'm just gonna take my uh, marking gauge here, and I'm gonna set it at one and a half inches. Yeah, so finger ah, through okay. there, and your thumb's gonna hold that. Okay. You want this parallel, you don't want this to twist on you at all. Twelve plus three, fifteen and three quarter. Okay, I'm gonna cast right there. Because we're gonna transcribe these marks all the way around on both sides, I'm gonna do a little tick mark to help me transcribe around. I'm gonna come all the way across here for a mark. Alright. We're gonna create a really nice knife wall along the shoulder with some chisels. I'm gonna make this a little bit deeper. I'm gonna take my chisel and just tear into that knife wall we made just a little bit. Okay. At a very small little angle. And the chisel will stop when it hits that knife wall. Ready to cut those tenons out? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I'm gonna cut down first. Okay. And I'm using a Ryoba saw with, which has ripped teeth on one side and cross cut on the other. And I'm gonna rip, because I'm going with the grain. I've got my thumb positioned to hold my saw right on the line where I want. And just watching my line all the way down. and kind of seesaw it back and forth all the way down. And sometimes the way the grain is going, it will try to drive your saw. It can be a challenge. Now I'm gonna turn it sideways and cross cut. And then it popped off. Okay, for these cheeks, I'm not gonna try to saw, saw to the line because it's really challenging on such a narrow and longer piece. I'm gonna leave myself a little bit of room because we're gonna use a really cool tool called a router plane to okay. finish those up.
pop that guy out. So, all right, now you see, um, kind of see our razor edge from our knife line. Mm -hmm. You see that little that little sliver right there? That would be something, and then there's a little bit of it right there. That's where you want to take a, a chisel, and usually a wider chisel works really nice here. And you put it, and you want super, super sharp, and you want to put it right in that, that wall, and then just slowly walk it down. Okay. I spent with Chris, the more impressed I was with his level of precision. When he was spending time just putting tiny little ticks on the edges of his work to reference and transfer from one side to the other, you know, that's pretty incredible. That's really a lot of forethought in your work. Building a bookcase with this level of detail means that each individual step needs to be done precisely. I'm going to lay out the tenons for this bottom here. And what I like to do is use the actual mortises that we made in the foot to get really exact tenons. For a dry fit? Yes, sir. All right. A lot of work so far. Yeah, it really has been. <clears throat> this is the rewarding part when you start seeing everything come together. You are over on that side. Come on. There we, there go. we go. Over here, get it started so that I can do my side. Okay, I'll line up this side. <laughs> Look at that. Beautiful. <laughs> that's literally That's right. what you want. Yes. That's awesome. This looks great. Good. So what's next for us? So we're going to lay out the joinery for the feet and we're gonna do a drawboard mortise and tenon on the feet. I already pre-drilled this side, and what's gonna happen here is you have a set of holes that go through the foot, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to use that same drill bit and mark on the tenon. Then I'm gonna offset that mark towards the shoulder just a little bit, like a 30 second, okay. and drill a hole at that location, and then they'll be offset. And then when I drive this peg through there, the offset will pull together and make a really, really strong joint at the bottom. Nice. And then we're gonna do tusks for all these through tenons here. And this is a tusk, I already made one. We have a couple more to make. Okay. 
what they're gonna do is they're gonna pull these shelves, just like the drawboard, ah. super tight into the side okay. and make it a really strong, rigid bookshelf. And then the top, this big old hunking piece of wood, we're just gonna go ahead and do a regular housed mortise and tenon that, and the top will sit right on top and look beautiful, all this nice wood up there. Nice. And perfect for displaying whatever. Oh, fantastic. All right. All right, well, let's get to it, man. Okay, let's do it. Ready for final assembly. Exactly. It's been a long journey and we're ready. Yeah. <laughs> so where do we start? Well, we're going to do the feet and sides first. We're okay. going to do the draw bore mortise and tenon here at the bottom. We're going to use some glue. Yeah. You know, we don't necessarily need to use glue on a draw board. The pegs actually hold it together really well, but I always like to just add a little dab of it. I just can't help myself. So. Doesn't hurt, man. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't hurt. So we're gonna put some just on each cheek, just a little bit. All right. There you are, sir. Thank you. All right. That flips over, yep. Okay. All right. All right, so go ahead and put a peg in the lower hole first, and we're just going to nice and easy tap it in. Okay and you'll end up hearing a change in tone when, when it seats all the way. Hear that? Yeah. Yep. Those are really cool saws, you know? They're nice. They don't have any set to the teeth, so they can do that without causing any damage. Wanna give her a shot? Shooting. Sure, no. I think we can put the shelves on there and use the tusks to tighten them up. I think it's easier to start at the bottom. Absolutely. There, oh, there it goes. goes. There it goes. There it goes. <laughs> there. There it goes. Nice, nice, nice. Very nice. Beautiful. All right. Got them all in there. Yep. Awesome. And you're just using a little tap on it, right? Yeah, just a couple little taps to really help snug it home. Looks good. That looks, looks so good. Awesome. Man. Okay, here we go. Get Hot. It's, it's coming down, yeah. Come down this way. Go, I'd say we're good. And that looks awesome. It went together, that's, that's <laughs> a lot of pieces that have to go together. Yeah. Wow. So what are we gonna use for this? We're gonna use some Danish oil. All right. For swipe. All right. It's always the best one. 
Oh yeah, look at that. Dude, <laughs> that looks great. Excellent wood choice. That's beautiful. Look at that. It's really, really nice. Just tell me how you got into woodworking, man. It started with my grandpa, who's my hero and inspiration in pretty much all of this. Back in middle school, probably, was the first time we built anything together. I said, hey, grandpa, can we build a fishing pole holder? And, uh, and any chance I could, I would go over to his shop and um, build things. And he was a really, really good woodworker. And uh, I would help him with construction stuff in the summers and everything too, and just fell in love with making anything. So where did your love of hand tools come from? I just uh, have always liked doing things kind of the hard way. <laughs> I don't know, I just gravitated towards hand tools. I was like, that looks like it's really challenging and therefore it's gonna be more rewarding because I felt that reward in other super challenging things. And so I just went down this journey of reading every book I could, getting any tool I could get my hands on, practicing with them, not being scared to try new things, challenging myself, and just fell in love with them. And so that's kind of what I really like to use when I can. Have you like always been into woodworking since you were a boy? I mean, did you do it? For a living before you started Third Coast? No, uh, I was out of high school. I went into the Air Force okay. and I did that for four years and, and got out and came back home and started going to school for engineering. And then and I was working on my master's about the same time that uh, my grandpa passed away oh, okay. and, and started this business of making YouTube videos. I guess it wasn't a business at first. It was just something I tried doing because I would go to YouTube to learn a lot of skills and I was finding that there were some skills that I wasn't finding good information on and then I would learn it other ways reading books and practicing mm -hmm. and then I tried passing that on in the videos for other people like me that might want to learn how to do that so I just stuck at it and then I started seeing some growth and a lot of positive feedback and people liked my designs and things like that and I just kept going and going uh, working essentially two jobs, my full-time job, and going to school, and trying to build this business. And it grew to a point where I talked to my wife. I was like, hey, what do you think about maybe quitting my job? And this is looking really promising. I get to do my dream. And so that's what happened. Quit my job was the scariest day of my life. Right. Good benefits, good job, you know, going to school. But my heart wasn't in those things. So we made the, she, she gave me the go ahead and we did it. It was, it's been awesome. Such a blessing. So amazing ever since. So a lot of your design looks heavily influenced um, by Japanese design or Asian design. Yeah. Where does that come from? In my research of traditional tools and traditional joinery, mm -hmm. uh, I came across Japanese woodworking and, and Asian woodworking, and they are just the masters. Yes. They are extremely good. And I really like a lot of their exposed joinery and they're exposed you know in in their buildings you see all these curved rafters and everything come out but they're so humble about everything too it's not like super ornamental and and over the top it's just it's super impressive but super clean and simple i do a few things and that are influenced by how i perceive a lot of their work but i am very very uh in awe of those craftsmen over there they are just masters of their craft, like for real. Yeah, because <laughs> a, a lot of your tooling is, is Japanese tooling. Yep, I have a lot of Japanese saws. Well, I started with Japanese saws because they were the most affordable at the time. Mm -hmm. When I was starting off with nothing, uh, I didn't have even a circular saw and things like that. My grandpa's, all, all his tools went away. And so the Japanese saws were, they're very affordable and they're super nice tools. And so I started with those, fell in love with them, and then fell in love with Japanese woodworking everything and discovered some of their hand tools like uh, planes and chisels. I really like their chisels. 
I'm still partial to Western style hand planes that you push. Mm -hmm. I just haven't got the knack for the Japanese <laughs> ones, but uh, the, you watch some of those Japanese craftsmen, those woodworkers pull those yeah. shavings that you can like barely see. Yeah. It's pretty impressive. It's totally impressive. Yeah. It's amazing. They're the best. <laughs> So I got to ask you, do you see yourself as a craftsman or as an artist? Um, I see myself as an asp aspiring to be both. Yeah? Yeah. Um, I really like, like I mentioned with on the YouTube channel, being able to be creative mm -hmm. and not kind, to, not kind of having to work for a client that's making me build a table how they want it. I get to come up with my own designs. So I really like to be artistic. And I have a lot more growing to do as far as proportions, style, curves. You know, there's so many things I want to continue to, like, I guess, mature in in my, my style. And um, so I feel like I'm an aspiring artist or, or whatever. Um, and same with a craftsman. I, I, like to, I like having the skills to be able to put into practice what I'm coming up with. And not just throwing it together. Something that's going to be an heirloom furniture, mm -hmm. an heirloom piece that's going to last a hundred years. Combining those two is really what I, it's really fun to me as I enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. Yeah. I love learning, right? Me too. Absolutely. It's, it's a never ending process in life. And if you stop learning, you're not living anymore. That's the truth, yeah. man. Well said. As we were building this bookcase, Chris said something to me that really resonated. He said, we're inviting people to look at our joinery. Now in building motorcycles, I've always looked at it a little differently. I add a tremendous amount of detail to my motorcycles because I want the owner to discover things over time. The longer they look at the machine, the more times they see it, the more detail they find. What he's suggesting is the exact opposite. He's asking us to look at the small details up front understand and acknowledge the beauty and functionality of the joinery. It's definitely something that I'm going to keep in my mind as I progress as a craftsman.